Chapter Seventeen of the Hand of Fu Manchu. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Hand of Fu Manchu by Sax Romer. Chapter Seventeen. I meet Doctor Fu Manchu. My next impression was of a splitting headache, which, as memory remounted its throne, brought up a train of recollections. I found myself to be seated upon a heavy wooden bench, set flat against a wall, which was covered with a kind of straw matting. My hands were firmly tied behind me. In the first agony of that reawakening I became aware of two things. I was in an operating room, for the most conspicuous item of its furniture was an operating table. Shaded lamps were suspended above it, and instruments, anaesthetics, dressings, etc., were arranged upon a glass-topped table beside it. Secondly, I had a companion. Seated upon a similar bench on the other side of the room was a heavily built man, his dark hair splashed with grey, as were his short, neatly trimmed beard and moustache. He too was pinioned, and he stared across the table with a glare in which a sort of stupefied wonderment predominated, but which was not free from terror. It was Sir Baldwin Fraser. "'Sir Baldwin,' I muttered, moistening my parched lips with my tongue. "'Sir Baldwin, how—' "'It is Dr. Petrie, is it not?' he said, his voice husky with emotion. "'Dr. Petrie, my dear sir, in mercy tell me, what does this mean? I have been kidnapped, drugged, made the victim of an inconceivable outrage at the very door of my own house.' I stood up unsteadily. "'Sir Baldwin,' I interrupted, "'you ask me what it means. It means that we are in the hands of Dr. Fu Manchu.' Sir Baldwin stared at me wildly. His face was white and drawn with anxiety. "'Dr. Fu Manchu,' he said, "'but, my dear sir, this name conveys nothing to me. Nothing.' His manner momentarily was growing more distraught. "'Since my captivity began, I have been given the use of a singular suite of rooms in this place, have received, I must confess, every possible attention. I have been waited upon by the she-devil who lured me here.' but not one word other than a species of coarse badinage has she spoken to me. At times I have been tempted to believe that the fate which frequently befalls the specialist had befallen me. You understand? I quite understand, I replied dully. There have been times in the past when I, too, have doubted my sanity in my dealings with the group who now holds us in their power. But, reiterated the other, his voice rising higher and higher, what does it mean, my dear sir? It is incredible, fantastic. Even now I find it difficult to disabuse my mind of that old haunting idea. Disabuse it at once, Sir Baldwin, I said bitterly. The facts are as you see them. The explanation, at any rate, in your own case, is quite beyond me. I was tracked. Hush! Someone is coming! We both turned and stared at an opening before which hung a sort of gaudily embroidered mat, as the sound of dragging footsteps accompanied by a heavy tapping announced the approach of someone. The mat was pulled aside by Zami. She turned her head, flashing around the apartment at a glance of her black eyes, then held the drapery aside to admit the entrance of another. Supporting himself by the aid of two heavy walking sticks and painfully dragging his gaunt frame along, Dr. Fu Manchu entered. I think I have never experienced in my life a sensation identical to that which now possessed me. Although Nayland Smith had declared Fu Manchu was alive, yet I would have sworn upon oath before any jury summonable that he was dead, for with my own eyes I had seen the bullet enter his skull. Now, whilst I crouched against the matting-covered wall, teeth tightly clenched and my very hair quivering upon my scalp, he dragged himself laboriously across the room, the sticks going tap, tap, tap upon the floor, and the tall body, enveloped in a yellow robe, bent grotesquely, gruesomely, with every effort which he made. He wore a surgical bandage about his skull, and its presence seemed to accentuate the height of the great dome-like brow, to throw into more evil prominence the wonderful satanic countenance of the man. His filmed eyes turning to right and left, he dragged himself to a wooden chair that stood beside the operating table and sank down upon it, breathing sibilantly, exhaustedly. Zami dropped the curtain and stood before it. She had discarded the dripping overall which she had been wearing when I had followed her across the common, and now stood before me with her black, frizzy hair unconfined and her beautiful, wicked face uplifted in a sort of cynical triumph. The big gold rings in her ears glittered strangely in the light of the electric lamps. 
she wore a garment which looked like a silken shawl draped about her in a wildly picturesque fashion and her hands upon her hips leant back against the curtain glancing defiantly from sir baldwin to myself those moments of silence which followed the entrance of the chinese doctor live in my memory and must live there for ever only the laboured breathing of fu manchu disturbed the stillness of the place not a sound penetrated to the room no one uttered a word then sir baldwin fajar began fu manchu in that indescribable voice alternating between the sibilant and the guttural you are promised a certain fee for your tavatas by my servant who summoned you it shall be paid and a gift of my personal gratitude be added to it he turned himself with difficulty to address sir baldwin and it became apparent to me that he was almost completely paralysed down one side of his body some little use he could make of his hand and arm for he still clutched the heavy carven stick but the right side of his face was completely immobile and rarely had i seen anything more ghastly than the effect produced upon that wonderful satanic countenance the mouth from the centre of the thin lips only opened to the left as he spoke in a word seen in profile from where i sat or rather crouched it was the face of a dead man sir baldwin fraser uttered no word but crouching upon the bench even as i crouched stared horror written upon every lineament at dr fu manchu the latter continued your experience sir baldwin will enable you readily to diagnose my symptoms owing to the passage of a bullet along a portion of the third left frontal into the posterior parietal convolution upon which from its lodgment in the skull it continues to press hemiplegia of the right side has supervened aphasia is present also the effort of speech was ghastly beads of perspiration dewed fu manchu's brow and i marvelled at the iron will of the man whereby alone he forced his half-numbed brain to perform its function he seemed to select his words elaborately and by this monstrous effort of will to compel his partially paralysed tongue to utter them some of the syllables were slurred but nevertheless distinguishable it was a demonstration of sheer force unlike any i had witnessed and it impressed me unforgettably the removal of this enjoyous protocol he continued would be an operation which i myself could undertake to perform successfully upon another it is a matter of some delicacy as you sir baldwin and slowly horribly turning the half dead and half living head towards me you dr petoy will appreciate in the event of clumsy surgery death may supervene failing this permanent hemiplegia or the film lifted from the green eyes and for a moment they flickered with transient horror idiocy any one of three of my pupils whom i might name could perform this operation with ease but their services are not available only one english surgeon occurred to me in this connection and you sir baldwin again he slowly turned his head were he dr petrie will act as anaesthetist and your duties completed you shall return to your home richer by the amount stipulated i have suitably prepared myself for the operation and i can assure you of the soundness of my heart i may advise you dr petrie again turning to me that my constitution is a note to the use of opium you will make due allowance for this mr liking su a graduate of canton will act as a dosa he turned laboriously to zarmi she clapped her hands and held the curtain aside a perfectly immobile chinaman whose age i was unable to guess and who wore a white overall entered bowed composedly to fraser and myself and began in a matter-of-fact way to prepare the dressings End of chapter seventeen